Hi everybody, um, welcome to today's webinar. Hopefully you can hear me and see me okay. Um, we're gonna make a start now. Um, my name is Juliet and I'm IID's events officer. So um, welcome to today's session. We're really excited about this webinar on nature-based solutions for climate change. Um, just so you're aware, this event forms part of the IIED debate series in which we are trying to create a space for uh, conversation and debate on key and current sustainable development issues. So welcome. Um, we've got an excellent uh, panel of speakers today who are going to be introduced shortly. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Shouting, who's going to introduce the session and our speakers for today. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Juliet. I'm Xiaoting Ho Jones, um, a senior researcher at IED. Thanks so much for joining us today on this very special day. As you all know, today is International Day for Biological Diversity. And this year's theme is Our Solutions Are in Nature. So under this special theme, we hope to use this webinar to explore with all of you how we can work with nature to tackle the due crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change. The term nature-based solution for climate change acknowledges the interdependency between people and the nature and the need for us to seek integrated solutions to the interlinked global challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change. It is indeed a very bottom as well. It covers the diversity of ways that we can work with nature we can work with nature to mitigate climate change, for example, forest unnatural carbon sinks, and we can also work with nature to adapt to climate change. For example, agrobiodiversity can help improve resilience of our food production system. Mangroves and reefs can buffer coastal storm surges and absorb flood water. It's great to see so many people joining us today from all over the world, um, the students, the ambassadors, the people working on the ground, helping communities, various NGOs. And I'm sure a lot of you probably are working with nature in very different ways, and they may have very different perceptions of what nature-based solution for climate change are. So before we start our discussion today, we would like to know a little bit about all of you by running a quick polling with you. So Juliet mentioned, go to your another screen if you have one, and go to www.mentimeter.com and enter the code 439473. There you can use up to three words to describe what nature-based solution for climate change means to you. We will have two minutes for all the participants to do this polling. Thank you. 
think I'll pause here. It's great to see so many people um, join us to give your ideas on what this nature-based solution for climate change means to you. There's such a big word cloud that definitely signifies and uh, shows the case of the diversity of ways we can work with nature really well. I do like to highlight that it's great to see the key words being resilience, biodiversity, sustainability, and adaptation and that comes up quite strongly, including people, how we can actually ensure that nature-based solutions work for people, increase the resilience of the society, and also help us promote sustainability. And these are some of the topics the speakers and all of us hopefully will explore today. And I think this also illustrates why if we, in the last year, nature-based solution has been embraced globally by NGOs, governments, and the private sector with many big commitments made in the last year, including various commitments announced this week for example, the new EU 10-year biodiversity plan. But today we really want to discuss with all of you on how can we translate those global ambitions and commitments into local actions. We're hoping to run this online discussion as interactively as possible. So as you see, um, we will keep on running some of the pollings and throughout the webinar, we also welcome you to all share your views and um, we would especially love to hear any concrete examples from all of you on how do you think we can translate the global ambitions for nature-based solution into actions and how we can also work with nature to move us from business as usual and deliver change we need urgently at scale to address climate change. So please feel free to keep using the chat box to share with everyone on your views and especially any examples that how you're working with nature to address biodiversity loss and climate change. Also, we have four distinguished speakers today representing government, private sector, and community members to help us kickstart the discussion, focusing on these two questions, those two questions you've seen on the screen before. As you listen to the speakers, again, please feel free to give examples, share your views as well. So that's enough from me now. I would like to introduce the first two speakers from the UK Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs to give a joint presentation. The two speakers are Alex White and Sarah Nelson. Alex is the team leader for international climate and strategy within the International Strategy and Overseas Development Assistant Division. Sarah is the head of policy oversight in the International Environmental Conventions team, and she's leading the nature package for the UNCCC COP26 for the UK government. So over to you, Alex and Sarah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, and uh, these are the excellent set of panelists. I'll let everyone reserve judgment on me until the end of the presentation on, on, on excellent and distinguished. Um, but um, thanks for everyone for spending the time this afternoon to um, listen to some of our thoughts. Um, I was going to run through a couple of uh, scene setting slides. Um, setting out some of the uh, context that um, we are looking at in terms of thinking about policy for nature-based solutions, uh, international policy. Um, I think the first uh, thing I want to look at is, is the sort of overview and context and the sort of multiple pressures on the natural world and ecosystems that, um, that we're currently facing. Uh, so in the past 50 years, um, for doubling of the human population Global economic output has grown by nearly four times, and global trade has grown by 10 times. This is essentially driving up the demand for energy and materials, uh, services that are, that are provided by nature. At the same time, uh, global temperatures are increasing, sea level is rising, we are feeling the effects of climate change, and we are experiencing an accelerating global species extinction. Um, the way I would kind of uh, sort of encapsulate this is that the demand is increasing but the supply is decreasing and I think it's interesting looking at the recent uh, Descriptor Review interim report which underpins the role of nature as an asset and highlighted that we are again failing to manage these assets effectively. So it's against this backdrop that we need to develop approaches that reflect the complexity and scale of this challenge 
and work for climate, nature and people. So nature-based solutions are part of that solution. Um, some of the evidence is telling us that solutions can provide up to a third of the cost-effective CO2 mitigation by 2030. Um, but that is important to recognize that nature-based solutions offer a part of the solution, but not all. Um, we need to ensure that we are still decarbonizing to make sure that um, we meet the Paris pathways. Um, if NBS is deliver, delivered appropriately, it could deliver a range of co-benefits that can address some of these multiple challenges. So climate change adaptation and mitigation, uh, development and livelihoods, and as, as well as the uh, biodiversity loss. So in thinking about how we deliver for uh, climate, nature and people, uh, we need to determine what the barriers are for uh, delivery of effective nature-based solutions. Uh, we have basically uh, done some analysis that has characterized five different areas of, of, of barriers. The first is around evidence, um, and this is um, around uh, the MBS evidence base, also what works, what doesn't, um, how can we um, effectively deliver MBS, the second is around political will, galvanizing um, uh, governments and businesses and others to um, make the changes that are needed to, to tackle the scale of the, the challenges. Um, three, around markets, governance and religion and, and, and regulation. I mean, this is really recognizing that uh, NBS implementation spans multiple landscapes crossing jurisdictional boundaries. And that approach to date have really captured the multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional nature of nature-based solutions. Uh, so how do we work across ministries, breaking down the silo between climate, biodiversity and people to deliver these solutions effectively? Uh, barrier four is around technical capacity and, and skills. Uh, there's lots of good learning out there that needs to be shared and we're really interested to hear from uh, the panelists, sorry, from the audience and panelists about experience on nature-based solutions. And finally, it's around finance. Uh, we recognize that there's great potential of nature-based solutions, but the finance that's being directed towards it is, is very minimal. So how do we rebalance that, uh, that sort of investment uh, scale? Um, I'll hand over to Sarah now. Thanks, Alex. Um, and great to see so many people here today online and um, from all over the world. So that's really um, nice to hear. So um, this year was due to be um, a big year for biodiversity, a so-called super year um, with both CBD COP15, uh, the IUCN World Conservation Congress and UNFCCC COP26, amongst other key events for biodiversity and climate change. Now, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, all of these have been postponed, but we're still really hopeful that um, over the next 12 to 18 months will um, provide a key moment for both biodiversity and climate change. Um, and looking at our COP um, in terms of COP26, nature will be a key focus for that. And we hope that it will build on a successful CBD COP15 that will take place in China. Um, the UK G7 presidency and the Italian G20 presidency will also be additional moments over the next 12 to 18 months to drive forward action on these issues. Um, and they will all propel us into the next decade, which will be a UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So as I mentioned, nature will be a key theme for COP26, with the UK Prime Minister describing the climate crises and the biodiversity crises as two sides of the same coin, recognising to achieve success on either, you need to tackle both of these issues simultaneously. The key headlines for our Nature COP26 campaign will include the following. Firstly, greening our supply chains. So this campaign will aim to work with producer and consumer countries to minimise deforestation within supply chains for key commodities such as palm oil, cocoa and soy. The second campaign will focus around nature finance and that will have three different strands to it. 
there'll be a public sector strand where we will be working with other donor countries to raise contributions to nature-based solutions and also where we will work with developing countries to help them build a pipeline of high quality MBS projects. There will also be a private sector component where we'll work with private sector to galvanise action um, on biodiversity finance. And we will also be working with the multilateral development banks to help mainstream nature across their operations. The third strand of our work will be building on the Just Rural Transition initiative, which was launched at the UN Climate Action Summit last year, which aims to build resilient and sustainable agriculture and food systems. And we will also be championing marine nature-based solutions through our work on, for example, marine protected areas, our 30 by 30 campaign, and the Global Ocean Alliance. And finally, we will be working to build on the MBS Manifesto, which was also launched at the UN Climate Action Summit last year, to develop a Nature Action Pledge. And the aim of this pledge will be to work with high ambition countries to commit to concrete actions on climate change and biodiversity to promote a clear bridge between the climate and biodiversity conventions. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah and Alex. Thanks, Alex, for reminding us that nature-based solution is one of the important solutions and highlighting some of the challenges. I think we'll hear from the next two speakers on how do we respond to some of the challenges. Again, we welcome all of you to share in the chat box if you have any reflections on those uh, challenges as well. And it's great, Sarah, you gave some really good examples on how UK government is taking an active leadership role in addressing some of the challenges, including increasing political will and then looking for building more finance that flow to the local level. And with that, I think it would be great if we can also hear from our next speaker, Chip Kung Lip. Um, Chip represents the AXA uh, XL, a multinational insurance company. He's the sustainable development director and uh, he established and managed AXA XL's ocean risk initiative. And he will offer some perspective from the private sector and uh, talk us through with some of the innovative financing um, products that they are promoting. Over to you, Chip. Thanks, Xiaoting, very much indeed. And uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody um, online. So, I want to just talk through this from a, a, a coastal resilience standpoint, which might be slightly different to um, what others um, have focused on previously. Um, I know that uh, you know, it was really the first time the issue was, was integrated into um, climate, ch ch climate change negotiations. Um, but of course, it's absolutely integral to understanding how the ocean drives change, uh, especially related to climates around the world. We know um, the oceans are warming, uh, will impact uh, increase in, in, in sea level rise, um, likely increase in intensity of storms um, as, uh, as uh, the century moves on, therefore having uh, greater um, implications for storm surges, coastal erosion, inundation, of course, human health and food security as well. Um, and given that um, we know that, or there's calculation that you know up to 800 million people will be at risk from coastal flooding from storm surges by 2028. The small island developing states and uh, the least developed countries of, uh, are those likely to be most affected. Um, but it's unlikely that um, uh, the insurers and indeed taxpayers will be able to bear these costs um, in the future or for too much longer. So. Um, we also know that green infrastructure has been really a go-to um, for those that can afford it, or for those countries that can afford it. Um, but of course, it's also less cost-effective um, and often harms biodiversity and the natural systems that it's protecting against as well. So I think it's absolutely right that nature-based solutions are being recognised and increasingly promoted, um, yet they are still often overlooked or underappreciated in policy decisions investment and indeed in risk management frameworks as well. And being from the insurance industry at AXA, um, you know, that focus on risk is, is key for us. Um, reefs, um, mangroves, seagrass beds, soil marshes and other coastal ecosystems um, not only provide coastal protection, of course, but also other co-benefits as well to 
uh, coastal communities to economies through building ecological and social resilience, um, as well as sustaining biodiversity. Um, we know, you know, reefs dissipate up to 90% of, like 7% of wave energy. Um, mangroves, 100 meters of mangroves, anticipate between 50 and 100%, of course, as well. Um, and so you're not only reducing annual flooding, um, and that to about 18 million people uh, around the world every year, but also decreasing flood damage risk uh, as well, and the, the likelihood of that without um, those, uh, those, those, that nature is about $82 billion as well. But going back to the question, so how do we translate global ambitions into, into nature-based um, solutions and actions? Well, I think this is exactly sort of the forum that's starting to build the narrative, and I think it's about d developing that narrative itself. Um, but I think the one thing that cuts through everything else is about uh, it's about money and putting a dollar figure on it. So I think that highlighting the economic or socio-economic um, importance of natural capital, which obviously nature, uh, naturally sort of linked to the dual benefits of climate change um, uh, targets and biodiversity is crucial as well. Now, the UN has called on the finance and insurance industries to help reduce exposure and vulnerability of coastal communities and ecosystems as well. Um, but it can't be left to just one part of uh, the, the global economy. It needs to investment from a combination of private, government, philanthropic and, and development finance. And so the use of these blended finance tools, um, including insurance, uh, at the moment are pretty under leveraged. Um, and I suppose the, the other sort of coin is that we also know that there's a couple of private capital available um, if investments into resilience, so basic nature-based solutions, can generate risk adjustable returns. But of course, as this slide shows here, um, there are significant barriers to investment in natural capital from a lack of understanding and how they can provide a time of return to that uh, limited pipeline. You can probably um, count the number of projects on the, on the fingers of two hands. Um, insufficient data and modeling, of course, um, and the enabling policies to shift uh, investment away from unsustainable infrastructure too. So, I think there's sort of real, um, real work to be done to, to, uh, to lower those barriers. Um, I, I wanted to sort of outline one example um, of, of what's been happening in this space. Um, and this is the launch of the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance um, last year at the UN Climate Action Summit as well. Um, and it's been backed by the, uh, all G7 countries. Um, and it's really a multi-sectoral collaboration designed to drive $500 million worth of investment into nature-based solutions uh, on the coast by 2030. Um, but alongside that, it's about developing further research that will help under, underpin the, the nature-based solutions argument. And I think importantly, help to inform policy at, at all different levels as well. Um, Canada has put up the first tranche of funding for this. Um, and, uh, it's, and, and that funding is being used not only to build the Secretariat of Aura, um, but also to develop some pilot projects as well. And then in the sort of next minute or so, I just want to highlight a couple of the, uh, the products that, that are being focused on. Um, so blue carbon is one. Um, so mangroves, as we know, provide a multitude of benefits, coastal protection, filtering pollution, carbon sequestration as well, and very importantly too. Um, and we know that um, restoration and protection of tidal wetlands are eligible, eligible for, for voluntary carbon offsets. Um, and so the Nature Conservancy and indeed one of uh, the projects that uh, my company um, is, is um, driving uh, ahead is the development of pilot studies in Virginia and Belize. Um, but we're also developing a resilience credit uh, alongside that carbon credit. So where companies can invest in restoration and, and protection um, to limit risks from storm surges and flooding. We're also focusing, or Aura is also focusing on potentially the development of a corporate bond where corporates borrow money to manage and maintain natural capital surrounding their property, um, having a positive impact on local communities, biodiversity, um, and of course, indeed, the tourism sector as well. From an insurance and um, risk perspective, we're starting to start looking at explicitly integrating natural capital into our risk models. Um, so we can actually accurately price risk uh, and support risk man management solutions. And those different products uh, include parametric insurance products, which trigger 
at a certain uh, when a certain parameter is reached. And so the idea of working on coral reef and mangrove insurance products um, is starting to pay out, uh, or starting to it's starting to move forward rather than pay out at this stage. Um, so look, just to just to 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 uh, to wrap up, I mean the projects and products at the moment are very much in their pilot phases, and I think it's really crucial that we are able to move these to scale as quickly as possible. But we can only do that with investment into that space. Um, and I think it's very key that we uh, start building the right narrative to engage those possible investors, and of course, to try and drive down those barriers that I mentioned before. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chip. And thanks for laying out some of the barriers to access finance for nature-based solutions, especially taking us to the coastal ecosystem. And it's very interesting to hear some of the new insurance products that may help us leverage the blended finance between government, private sector, and the financial piece. But I think we also, if for all of us who work in the field in developing countries, there's another very important investor we shouldn't really forget, that's the local communities. And uh, we've seen all of the world that local communities are investing themselves to adapt to climate change, for example, in using or leading, championing some of the innovative ways to work with nature to adapt or mitigate climate change. So with that, I want to introduce our last but also very exciting speaker from um, all the way from Zambia to take us from the coastal region to the forest and the farm landscapes in Zambia, Musonda Kapena. Muzonda is the CEO of the Zambia National Forest Commodities Association, and she has over 20 years experience working with forest communities. Muzonda, over to you. Thanks a lot, Zhao Ting. Um, greetings from Zambia. Um, as explained, I represent the Apex organization, which is called the Zambia National Forest Commodity Association, with the support of the Forest and Farm Facility Program, in collaboration with FAO, IUCN, IIED, and AgriCord. So I'm very happy that I'm joining in the webinar, and I would like to share the African and Zambian experience from the community level. So I'll start with the African perspective in the sense that um, most times, most people don't know that Africa is home to about 25% of the world's remaining rainforests, but this is very quickly disappearing. And about 70% of the population of Africa depend on forests and woodlands for their livelihood. Unfortunately, climate change is already impacting very strongly on, on the African livelihoods, mainly due to land, land use changes. And this accounts to a huge proportion of greenhouse emissions. In short, what this means is that there's so much industrialization, there's mining, so land use is changing from forest use to industrialized uses, as I've mentioned. Um, there's urgent need on a continental basis to manage the natural forests and of course to better adapt our ways, our levels of development to, uh, to mitigate climate change. So from the picture, this is uh, the map of Zambia. It's very diverse. And according to the UNFAO statistics, there's about 65% um, or thereabout or translated into 49 million hectares of Zambia is natural forest. But out of that, there's about 62,000 hectares, which is um, exotic plantations. This actually contributes to the to the construction industry where wood is, is used for all kinds of purposes. So for Zambia, the, the, the change in forest cover has been documented still by FAO that between um, 1990 and 2010, Zambia has lost an average of 166,000 hectares or approximately 0.32 percent per year. So in total, between this period, Zambia has actually lost 6.3 percent of its forest cover, or in terms of hectares, 3 million hectares has been lost. 
with these statistics, which often seem boring, it's an indicator that we really need to do a lot more. There's an urgent need for us to manage the natural resources for us to adapt to the climate change, which isn't a Zambian issue alone or an African issue, it's a global issue. So what have we done as the Zambia National Forest Commodity Association? We work with farm and forest producer organizations and, we and through this, we support the natural based solutions for climate change. Our mandate is to support the use of indigenous knowledge systems. Most people may not understand this, but when we use indigenous knowledge systems, we are not teaching the forest communities anything new. We're actually learning from them on how they have been able to keep the forest and its resources in trust for us to have found in our generation. The question is, what will we be leaving for the next generation? So looking at the top right photograph, it shows a woman in Skaunzwe. Skaunzwe is in the southern tip of Zambia on the border with Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. She's using her hands to crack the, a seed from a tree. The tree species is the Mungongo tree, and it has a very hard shell, but in the center is a, is a nut with edible oil. The oil has been used for centuries for cooking and for, and for cosmetic purposes. But as you can see, the technology hasn't changed in that period. And that's what the ZNFCA is looking at through our incubation systems. As, a, as an association, we have groups from forest, um, forest communities and what we have is an incubation hub, which uses the indigenous knowledge, learning from them, but coupling it with modern technology so that these women can actually make a little bit of money from that, actually a lot of money. Then also what we do is we are lobbying the powers that be through the forest communities so that the realization that these are an in, these are an indispensable foundation for empowering them as they are already and have always championed nature-based solutions. We also support the landscape as an approach to ensure ecological resilience, especially for water. Zambia has about 45% of fresh water in the Southern African region, but this is quickly diminishing in the sense that once the forest cover is removed, you expose the hydrology of any area to, to uh, diminish its resources. So we're happy to say that through the forest and farm facility program with assistance from FAO, IUCN, IIED and AgriCord, we are really trying to ensure that the nature-based solutions are championed as the solution to mitigation of climate change, not only in Zambia or Africa, but across the world as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Muzonda. It was great to see all those pictures from the field that showcases how the local communities are really investing their time, resources, and, and the knowledge into nature-based solution. And I, I think here, I just also want to highlight that um, in partnership IUCN and the UNEP WCMC, IED has also recently collated evidence of the effectiveness of nature-based solutions for adaptation in 12 countries. And the result really tells the same story with what Musonda has showed us, that only when the communities are meaningfully engaged and, and we empower them and value the indigenous and the local knowledges, that's when it's an essential building block for us to have any type of effective nature-based solutions. And it's also great to see a lot of good examples coming through the chat box. And I think, Juliet, could you put up the next slide of the Mentimeter? So before we go to the, to the question and answer, and there's so many great questions already coming through, we also want to run another polling with you, just reflecting on what you have heard from all the speakers and also from your experiences. Can you go to Mentimeter, use the code 12, 4555 and share up to three words to describe the most important building blocks you heard or you've experienced 
for translating global ambition for MBS into local actions. We'll give three minutes this time because probably people need to digest a little bit what you heard from the speakers and uh, what you see in the chat box. So please do help us um, with the polling. Three minutes. Thanks everyone. I think I'll pause there. It's, we can all see the word cloud on the screen and it's really encouraging also to see the very strong message on that we definitely need finance, we need collaboration, and we need indigenous people's knowledge and the participation collaboration between different stakeholders. And that really also kind of a good segue for us to translate into um, doing some of the question and answer with all the speakers. I think since the finance is popping up in the middle, maybe we'll just first take up the barriers for assets in finance question. And Chip in his presentation already gave us some of those barriers from a private sector perspective. And I think Alex, could you probably from a UK government perspective, what do you think from your experience are the biggest barriers for accessing finance for nature-based solution for climate change? Over to you, Alex. Thanks, I think. Um, I, th I thought Chip's slide was uh, really useful in, in regard to some of the obstacles to uh, delivering finance for nature-based solutions. I mean, I think um, one of the one of the barriers is, is the sort of complexity, um, not only of uh, the uh, NBS itself, but also the finance mechanisms um, required to bring in private finance, the sort of use of innovative blended finance vehicles. 
Um, another uh, barrier is, this, is the, uh, the, the time scales with nature based solutions as well, and um, the sort of short, medium, and long term returns, um, which may potentially be exacerbated by um, some of the, 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 the COVID responses as well, given the, the likely need for a very swift uh, uptick in economic activity. Um, the lack of a, of a pipeline of, of what we call bankable projects that um, have uh, transparent enough uh, business cases and data to allow for investment. Um, I would say those are probably the, the, the key things that, that um, I would comment on on, on, on the barriers um, and the areas that, that we're working on to try and remove those barriers to, to increase investment. Thanks, Alex. And also now I wonder from your perspective, working with communities, you gave quite good examples on how they are already diversifying their value chains and product lines to be more resilient and uh, to support those communities efforts or how is the communities um, working to increase the finance or are, are there any barriers for them to access finance? How do we help them? Do you have any, Musona? Uh, over to you. Okay, um, there are quite a lot of barriers for local communities to invest in their own indigenous knowledge, mainly because they don't have the savvy knowledge of how the rest of the world deals with grants and finances and stuff like that. So that is also part of the work that the Zambia National Forest Commodity Association is doing in bringing them up to speed as best as they, as um, best as we can, so that they at least start understanding the elementary processes of applying for funds and grants, but also how to account for them. The need for finance is great in the sense that they need to translate their knowledge and products into internationally acceptable forms. For example, edible oils and cosmetic oils is what they use all the time, but the packaging and the um, secondary processing of the oils is what is required. And what we are looking at in terms of investment is for international, local and community people to start investing into presentable ways, branded, chemically analyzed processes for everybody to then realize that from straight from the nut, the oil is edible, it is usable, it has been used for centuries in the villages by themselves, and now it's about popularizing these products, knowing that they are organic and they are assisting communities conserve certain species, which in turn ensures that biodiversity is conserved as much as possible. Sure, Ting, I, let me just um, chip in if I can, just because um, you know there's some I think there's some really important work um, in, well, in, in lots of different countries around the world, but um, more specifically about um, microfinance um, and uh, the use of microfinance and, and certainly microinsurance as well. Um, and so how you um, develop um, working with um, local people on, um, on encouraging uh, the use of microinsurance to help finance more sustainable practices into the future. So I think it's a, a really key focus um, from an insurance industry perspective. Um, and that's very much what you know, the UN has asked the insurance industry to do is to, is to start working with governments and, and local governments um, to, to build out that more sustainable um, finance and insurance um, product. Thanks, Chip. Indeed, there's a quite a lot of interesting finance model um, out there. And uh, as Musonda highlighted, sometimes the challenge is organizing those small producers to be able to speak to the private sector who's providing, our government who's providing those type of microfinance, microinsurance, and help them to access that. And uh, 
Alex, I guess what you were trying to say, some of the barriers with time skills and the, how do we link the medium in long term is also building potentially some of the local communities' capacities in being the champions, locally rooted, championing those long term solutions and supporting them to access finance and the government can come in to do more capacity building to bridge that gap between the different finance tools being introduced and the local community who is actually investing quite a lot in those. And I think that's then come back to this top voted question from all the audience about how do we then better encourage and ensure that the indigenous people's knowledge and the local knowledge can be integrated in designing, um, justifying, implementing nature-based solution. And I think, uh, Musonda, you have been given quite an interesting examples of how, how exactly you're working with your local community to do that. Um, I think maybe over to Alex, again, from your experience and uh, DEFRA has been, been also supporting this type of local initiatives, what are some of the ways to, to in your view, to ensure that the integration of local knowledge? Well, I, I, I'll talk in a, in a very general way about this thing and, and just reflect on the importance of it, um, not only in terms of um, enabling projects to work in the long term and to be sustainable, but also reflecting the fact that nature-based solutions are uh, very locally specific based on uh, uh, local geographies, topography, habitats, but also knowledge and management. And in order for uh, projects to, uh, to be successful, we need to engage um, in, in, a, in a partnership manner. Um, I think that that's one of the things I've just really emphasized. Um, and, um, I think also the point about knowledge sharing, I think again that, that, that that's critical um, and one thing that you know uh, we have going for us is uh, in this you know uh, world that's very globalized and very connected is the ability to share information very very quickly with multiple stakeholders. So I think trying to um, build capacity to share that information to make sure that, it, that it's uh, suitably um, critiqued, to make sure that it's, it's, it's robust and usable, I, I think is really critical to try and uh, build a sort of a, a global network of, of knowledge that can enable people to move faster and to learn from other people's lessons. Um, I, I'll just add to that just one point, which is um, for those who um, are not aware, the UK um, is also due to host um, a joint meeting of the IPBES IPCC workshop and um, that was due to be held last week and um, so those are the scientific bodies for both the biodiversity and the climate change convention and um, that that's also been postponed but the plan is for that to run either later this year or early next year um, and we'll make sure um, in that that um, community-based evidence is embedded um, in, in the outputs from that workshop as well and then communicated um, widely so, so that's sort of one aspect that we can do to help from UK government side as well. Thanks so much Alex and Sarah and uh, it I just want to also thank the audience who have been providing examples on how you work with local communities to integrate their knowledge as well. It's great to see examples not only in developing countries, but also UK. And I just, again, encourage you to keep on sharing some of the ideas and, in, and uh, respond. Everyone can respond to some of the top voted questions you see in the Q&A box and those um, you, the example you shared will be shared more widely. And with that, uh, um, there's a quite a lot of questions actually, understandably, about COVID-19, because obviously this is the, the daily life and uh, we being all uh, <laughs> stuck at home and, and I'm working on this virtual webinar from my office. And this is obviously on everyone's mind at the moment. And we have a lot of government now talking about the strategies of building back better from COVID-19. So in this context, how do we then think about nature-based solution? How can nature-based solution be helpful integrated into building back better narratives and strategies globally? I think that's a question probably posed to all the speakers. If uh, Musonda, maybe we can first hear from you. Hi, um, yeah. So there's a lot in terms of 
responding to the COVID-19 in the sense that as an organization, we have gone around a lot of the communities, but of course the challenge has been getting the permits from the Ministry of Health. Um, locally as a country, there are precautions that we've been asked to make. So we need to wear our masks and use sanitizers. But the thing is that when we go and visit the forest communities, they are not very sure about what COVID-19 is. So there's a very high need for us and similar organizations to go out in the forest communities, which are not along the line of rail or along main roads. They are inside. Um, some of them are, are in very hard to reach areas and to actually provide the truth about what COVID-19 is, how it's contracted, what prevention measures can be taken. And we learned, interestingly, that they already have indigenous ways of prevention for things like flu. So of course, um, COVID is a huge thing and it's a word they may not really understand, but when we're able to break it down and talk about the symptoms, they already have um, herbal supplements that they've been using from about March when it hit Zambia. And it's really, really great that most of them are not even getting the flus, considering that Zambia is entering into its cold season of the year. So there's a lot of need we need to collectively do, but also we need to learn from them on how else they can prevent infection, knowing that sanitizers and masks are expensive and in some cases are not accessible to the forest communities. Additionally, most of the fruits in the forests are ripening now. For example, the baobab, the tamarinds and a few others. So they are scared that when the urban populations come to buy the products, they might come in with the flu. So what we're working with with FAO under the FFF program is to come up with mechanisms which will ensure bulking of the product and instead of the urban buyers entering the forest communities, having one or two trained personnel from the forest communities to go into the urban areas with the products. But all that is a work in progress and as you know, we don't have a lot of time to keep thinking. So we have started acting on mobile transactions for money and e-services for them to actually see the product and all that. So it's not as easy to just come up with ideas like that, but with um, constant consultation with the forest and farm producer organizations, they too are telling us that they do not want urban people to come in they are scared, so they would prefer to actually take it to the nearest road network or the nearest CBD of a town and sell it from a centralized place on behalf of the forest communities in their areas. Thanks, Musonda. I think it's really bring to home the message that some of, we do need to understand some of the local challenges and uh, the COVID-19 is impacting some of the local practitioners' ability to carry out and implement nature-based solutions. But at the same time, for me, it's quite encouraging to see that if we invest in local bodies that support locally rooted organizations that support and mobilize and organize local communities for implementing nature-based solutions, they can also be there to respond to other risks like COVID-19 and make them more resilient, like Muzonta's organization is doing currently. So it's quite a really important lesson for us, for me at least, to hearing Musonda talking about how we can think about nature-based solution, investing in nature-based solution in the future to make local communities resilient to all the different types of risks they're facing. And then Chip, can we probably go to you to give some reflections about how um, in private sector may re re uh, respond to COVID-19 and how then the support and the innovative finance packages uh, for nature-based solution can be considered or innovated in the COVID-19 context? Look, I think there are sort of two, two parts to this answer. Well, maybe three actually. One is that, as Masunda said, you know, the, the sort of on-the-ground response um, and, you know, the, the likes of, uh, you know, the, the, the um, NGO community that are, that are helping to uh, respond um, to that. I think then you sort of look at this uh, from a short and a, and a longer term perspective. 
Um, and the short term perspective, I think, um, is uh, is probably quite surprising, not surprisingly, uh, focused on the on how we um, drive out of, of this COVID um, uh, pandemic. Um, and I'm you know, very aware of the fact that you know, the insurance industry has a, a, a fairly large role to play in that, um, not just from a health perspective, um, or you know, one being a health perspective, which is a fairly large part of it, um, but also uh, driving, um, uh, to helping uh, the economy and, and economies uh, to drive out of this as well. So I think that that's part of it. So we, we do have a very focused um, view on, on things at the moment, and it's sort of very much on sort of the, the things that are right in front of us. But of course, we've got to take this longer term view. Um, and that's very much sort of where I think, you know, this kind of conversation is really um, important. That, um, and, you know, still working with governments um, and in collaboration with, with others really to, to continue to drive NBS as a, uh, as a key and a core solution as we move forward. Um, and, you know, I think that's very much uh, um, a, a, about building those uh, communities um, of, uh, of, of organizations and across the private sector uh, into, you know, um, philanthropy, governments, etc. So I think that I think that longer term view is really key. I think that there is potential opportunity now to start talking about um, uh, you know, certainly when when debt is fairly cheap, um, whether it's possible to start borrowing on that uh, for, for to, to focus on resilience more specifically um, and you know I, I think that well, well let's see how long that that debt is cheap for but I think it's a it, it may be something that um, we should be starting to to, uh, to, to communicate to investors um, that resilience um, and nature-based solutions is, is a it's maybe a, an interesting place to to put their money Thanks, Chip. And it is important to, to think maybe in this we can see a silver lining of opportunity to reset our economy in a more sustainable footing, um, looking at the opportunities of cheap debt, for example. And then I think that also gave a good segue probably to Alex first and then Sarah next to talk more about, some, as Chip mentioned, then it's also important to work with government to think about the strategy um, from COVID-19 recovery. So from your ex ex perspective, could you share a little bit on how do you see nature-based solutions role in the COVID-19 recovery back, back to narrative? Thank you. Thanks, Ding. I mean, I have probably more of a, uh, a general comment on this, and I've been reflecting on Chip's point about the, about the long term and, and, and the resetting point. Um, I mean, the World Bank and others are doing lots of thinking about how the global economy can, uh, build back better. Um, and I think one thing that, that's probably how I wanted to point out is that, you know, as we enter this point of coming out of the pandemic, it's the point at which the risk and opportunities are at, at their greatest. The, the risk of trying to resort to a business as usual type way of uh, behavior, which we've seen has not been working for the environment up to now, versus the opportunity of, of, of building a, uh, uh, more sort of sustainable, longer-term uh, um, global economy, and nature has has a role in that, um, uh, for sure. But I think it's just being alive to the fact that, that this is a really pivotal moment, and that we need to make sure that uh, that, that we get it right. Um, thanks. I can um, probably talk a little bit about um, what the UK government's doing in this space at the moment. And um, this is all an emerging picture, of course, because we are uh, midst the pandemic. Um, so, I mean, one, just to reassure you that conversations are going on right across government about this, um, these discussions on building back better putting um, nature and um, making sure that when we do have a recovery that it's resilient and sustainable. Um, and many of you may have seen um, the article that uh, Lord Goldsmith wrote in the Financial Times earlier this week on this issue, which um, really makes um, the links between everything we've been talking today, the impacts of COVID and the importance then of actually making sure when we do um, 
come through this and we um, start to recover that we we do put nature um, at the heart of that recovery so um, I guess, I guess it's a sort of holding answer for now because we are still in the in the sort of um, very um, early stages of thinking about this, thinking about what we need to do to build back better. Um, but I do think that, um, I mean, I completely agree with both Chip and Alex on this, that a long term solution is needed. And I, I really um, look forward to the work that um, Dasgupta review team are doing on the economics of biodiversity and seeing whether there's any sort of emerging findings from there which we can really help um, sort of mainstream these issues uh, into our finance um, and decision making going forwards. Thanks. Thanks. It is encouraging to, to see those conversations is happening and the thinking is happening at the national government level. And I, I do realize we're running out a little bit of time and uh, there are questions about basically the next top voted question is about how good examples from cities. I do recognize that most of us actually work not just in cities and uh, probably in more rural or suburban yeah, um, area. So I do probably encourage you, I'll, I'll pass this question to the audience and if you have examples of cities, please do provide. The next two very interesting questions linked to technology. So how are we, the role of emerging technology and, and, and those especially locally relevant technologies, and what are their roles for MBS? But I think probably also on the flip side of that coin, when we look at technologies, the other question is that, are we talking too much more about nature-based solutions, overly human-driven, human interventions for nature-based solutions? And what are the opportunities for rewilding of nature that potentially is also cost-effective? And again, I, I think maybe um, we can flip this time um, the answering and it's all still to all the panelists just to give you a quick response to this. Um, do, you, who do, do you want to take this question first? Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll have a, um, I'll just talk about technology very briefly, but I think that um, in terms of, I think this all needs to be based in science um, and on scientific, um, on scientific understanding, peer reviewed um, science and I think that's absolutely critical of course that takes time um, there's a lot of there is work going on in, in an understanding how nature-based solutions what nature-based solutions can actually do um, I think technology piece um, is critical and I think that things like utilizing um, mapping um, is probably one of the most important things um, there, there is some work of course being done on that probably quite a lot um i think that needs to get into the hat well certainly from my perspective the hands of, of of uh the insurance industry um so we can start to to identify and utilize that to to better understand the impact um of degradation um and then we can start to uh, to, to price risk more accurately as well so i think yes technology is is key but i think Part of that is not just sort of the global uh, overview, but also uh, local understanding and local use of that um, too. Thanks, Alex. I saw your hand as well. Uh, thanks. I think yeah. I know. I think I think uh, uh, has kind of covered what I was going to say. But I think I think basically in science, when evidence is critical, um, technology is hugely important in terms of the sort of transparency and data piece as well of nature-based solutions and thinking about. Uh, um, building up the evidence for uh, investment and for de-risking investment as well. And that's everything from uh, Earth observation satellites to uh, using drones, etc., to monitor developments on the ground. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's critical um, at a sort of meta level in terms of the mapping side, but also at a local level to maybe get over some of the issues around um uh, resource and capacity for example thank you and musonda do you have any examples of how the local communities are working with technologies or what are some of the locally relevant technology you've seen thanks a lot well currently um communities in zambia are looking are already trying to use inventory technology which isn't based on anything high tech but they're looking at counting their resources, taking an inventory of how many baobab trees they have, how many tabs, 
medicinal trees they are in the sense that there's conflicting uses of these trees, like the energy sector where charcoal is manufactured from any tree species. So for the future, we're looking at using drones and using mapping GPS systems to ensure that each community has forest tenure then they will have control of the forest. As it is now, these um, usable species are found across open areas which really don't belong to, ev to anybody. But as the, as the old adage says, what belongs to everybody ends up belonging to nobody because everybody feels that they can enter and just harvest whatever they feel like. So as soon as we adapt um, appropriate technology, it, it will be easy to have projections of volumes based on seasonality. Not every year is the same as the other year. This year, we haven't got as much uh, baobab in the sense that traditionally each baobab tree produces like 500 pods of baobab. But this year, each tree is producing like 100. But that information is already transmitted from one generation to the other. We're coming up with a documentation system with evidence that this particular tree in this area would be utilized and belonging to this particular forest community group. But additionally, in the processing of forest products, we've used the pestle and mortar or the cracking by hand for a long time. We're looking at adaptable technologies which would include nut crackers, oilers, pan labeling, seems rudimentary, but that's a step ahead of what the forest communities are using now. It will be faster, more hygienic, and easier to market when the packaging and the quality is, is controlled with, um, for example, pen-sized hygrometers and all that, then they would be able to know what quality they need to consistently churn out, as opposed to now where they're only selling out raw fruit and raw oil without value addition to it. So it's a very welcome aspect that there's needed for, there's need for appropriate technology based on each geographical area. And most of it has to be solar based because we don't have as much electricity in the forest communities as we have in the urban areas. Thank you. Great, thanks. That's a good to think about. So there's a technology that can help us work better with nature, generating enough science for us to understand how do we actually effectively work with nature to adapt to climate change and um, uh, mitigate climate change, inventory technologies, mapping. It's uh, quite interesting to then also hear about technology that can help with access to finance. So for local communities, Musonda was giving the example of how technology can help them package their diversified products uh, in the resilient food production systems to access market and uh, have a better premium price. And I think about the, the couple of key things I also heard that's quite important is that the technology is not only saying we still need to think about how to integrate technology with local knowledge. And then there's also very important enabling conditions, policy conditions for those technology to work, like the forest tenure and the secure tenure for local communities. And with that, we're coming to the end of the webinar. But just before we finish, since it's International Day for Biodiversity, I would also like to finish our discussion on my more biodiversity specific note and coming back to that enabling policy framework and Sarah what you talked about the beginning of importance of increase the global ambition one immediate concrete opportunity with uh, Sarah you touched upon is influencing and skill up ambition for MBS for climate change in the post 2020 biodiversity framework which is currently being negotiated and will set specific targets and hopefully an ambitious plan to transform our relationship with nature. So based on what we discussed today and all the chats, a good example we've seen in the chat box, I would like to invite the, all the speakers to just give one last minute to, to share your recommendation for what do you want to see in the post-2020 biodiversity framework. And Musona, can we start with you again? Thanks a lot. There's an old African adage which goes, if you don't know where you're going, stop and look back and learn from where you're coming from. So um, representing indigenous knowledge systems and forest communities, it's important that a lot more investment is put in 
of appropriate technology, appropriate collaboration. I'm emphasizing on appropriate because technology is very wide, but at the same time, we're looking forward to conserving the forest biodiversity in the sense that in it is the secret to everything. In it, without a, a biodiversity, we'll be losing who we are as a people because our existence is based on where we have come from, where we had fruits and foods and medicines and water and soils and bees and honey in abundance. But as every day goes by, we are losing thousands and millions of hectares around the world of rainforests, of woodlands, of grasslands, which have sustained us for aeons before us. So it's important that we all really start to act. We've talked a lot, but we need to each act so that each of us can then be responsible and accountable to the whole world in terms of the next generation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chip. I think that, I think it's just integrating and ensuring that the finance community is part of the discussion. Um, I think that there's a, a real need, and I, you know, certainly from, from our point of view at AXA, uh, you know, we, we don't just insure things, um, whether it be health uh, and or um, well, anything really, um, but also we are a fairly important investor. Um, and so I think that there's a need to really drive a, a better understanding for the kind of public investing, you know, the, the investing um, at that scale uh, where corporates are able to undertake assessments um, of risk and opportunities um, in the space um, and and for me I think you know focusing on biodiversity more specifically um, that's absolutely critical because evidently everything that we do is based upon um, you know what the world has given us um, and so um, I think yeah engaging the finance community is a really key part I think of, of opening that door. Thanks, Chip. And one thing I did forget to say is that uh, please, the uh, audience, if you have any specific recommendation for the post-2020 biodiversity framework, please put it in the chat box as well. And then now over to you, um, Sarah, and then um, Alex, you can um, be the last words on this webinar. Thank you. So um, as someone who was um, around in 2010 when the Aichi biodiversity targets um, were being agreed, um, I think from my perspective, it's not so much um, what I would want to see in the framework, although it, it, it is related, it's, it's very much to me how we then make sure that any framework is implemented effectively. So I think, um, you know, many people would argue that the post, the current Aichi targets, um, they do tackle the main drivers of decline in biodiversity. That's, that's not the, the thing under question, what actually is the thing under question is that that framework is not working in terms of the implementation mechanisms when it gets down to the country level. So how do we actually increase that implementation? Um, and to do that, you will need to start looking at some of those underlying drivers um, of biodiversity, such as consumption, production, finance, um, looking at how we mainstream the economics um, into biodiversity, et cetera. So um, that, that would be from my, from my side, make sure that we actually implement this one effectively. Thanks. Definitely implementation. Alex. Uh, yeah, it's quite intimidating to have, to have the last last word on this. Um, so I, th I think I'll just I'll keep it uh, fairly high level. I'm kind of reflecting on what Sarah was saying. I think the the post industry framework needs to reflect the scale and complexity of the problem that we're facing. Um, so the ambition that needs to be generated, the innovation um, that needs to be applied to uh, implementation around uh, you know, in mainstreaming finance and consumption, there are some big decisions I think that need to be made or that can be made. And I think that parties going into this should, should be mindful of that. Um, and I would also add one other point is joining that up with COP26 and the UNFCCC and the climate debate and with the, the post-COVID recovery. I mean, in a way, you could argue that the delay to the COPs is useful in that context. 
um, but really to, to embrace the ambition and innovation required to, to address these solutions. Thanks, Alex, for reminding us keeping our eyes on the target and uh, keep on pushing the global ambition collectively. With that, I just want to quickly say thank you to all the panelists and all the participants who joined us today. Sorry, we ran over a little bit, um, but just a quick um, note on what will happen next. We'll summarize some of the key points into a block, though that may not capture all the very rich discussions and the chats we had today. So we'll also post a recording of this webinar on YouTube and share with all of those who have registered. Most importantly, we hope this webinar has provided all of you with some food for thoughts and some useful context and uh, examples. So please continue to connect with each other and reach out to others you met over the webinar. You see some examples in the chat you think it's interesting please do follow up and then some of the questions i do realize we didn't have time to cover all of them but you can get in touch with us and the, the panelists as well post the webinar and we can also continue the discussion after this please contact ied if you have any feedback on the webinar and the, also if you want to learn more about ied's work on the intersection of nature climate development we very much look forward to future collaborations and a continued discussion with you all and happy international biodiversity day to all thanks everyone and have a great weekend i hope you go out to the nature <laughs>